Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Thanks, Phil, and good morning. Um, it's so good to be with you um, in person. I didn't think that was going to be possible. And when Andrew and I filmed a version of this talk, in case I could not be here, um, we did so in our kitchen uh, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because there was freshly baked banana bread on the counter. So it was the ideal prop for give us today our daily bread. Ruth's mom has been uh, baking banana bread for a lifetime, so we're often the beneficiaries of it, and we're a bit fascinated by the lockdown fascination with banana bread, everyone posting their attempt to bake it online. Uh, uh, The other reason it was the right location um, is because the best conversations in our house take place around the kitchen table. And I think this part of the Lord's Prayer has something uh, to say to us about conversations with God, and I'm talking about two-way conversations. We are, this morning, continuing our series on the Lord's Prayer, and it's good we're taking our time to really explore it. Um, We learned it at school, said it in assembly, those of us who grew up in the traditional denominations recited it every Sunday morning, and I choose the word recited deliberately because gauging by the speed at which we delivered each line, I'm not sure we ever really prayed it. And if there's one line where we could really easily miss the significance, it's this one. Give us today our daily bread. What more needs to be said? Why would anyone feel the need to do an exegesis of those six words? Well, there's so much truth in these six words. Phil and I are going to spend the next two Sundays digging. In case you're joining us for the first time or you have a memory like mine, let me give you a little bit of context. The Lord's Prayer appears in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now remember, each of those writers is giving their own synopsis of Jesus, their own perspective of Jesus. Matthew presents him as the king, Mark presents him as the servant, Luke presents him as the man. In other words, this prayer is so all-encompassing. It reveals Jesus as the king, as the servant, and as someone who knows exactly what it's like to live here on planet Earth. This isn't just a piece of liturgy. It's about real life and it's about real issues. You see, we're only like two minutes in and we've already discovered that this is much more than an ABC on prayer for the disciples. The prayer falls into two parts, as you already know. The first part dealing with God and the second dealing with us. The first part focused on his glory and the second focused on our need. By this point, we've already had three requests. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And now we are pivoting to a different three requests. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation. You see, we cannot begin to pray about us. We cannot begin to think about our needs until we have the right perspective of God. Until we have God in his proper place. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting we just tick the God box and then move into the us box. That's not how it works. He is exalted in the first part. And he remains exalted in the second part. Let me try and explain that. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. God's name is sanctified, his kingdom comes, and his will is done by the giving to us of our daily bread. By the forgiving of our sins. By the leading us away from temptation. So God remains exalted from the beginning to the end. In his book, Lord, Teach Us to Pray, Andrew Murray from the Dutch Reformed Church writes this. First, thy name, thy kingdom, thy will, 
then give us, forgive us, deliver us. The lesson is of more importance than we think. In true worship, the Father must be first, must be all. What a quote. The Father must be first, must be all. Now, you might think we're going to talk about bread literally, and we are. This is about our physical need. We shouldn't be surprised by that. When God led uh, the Israelites out of Egypt, he led them to a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. Only when Israel abandoned God did she find herself in famine. But those who stayed faithful, like the prophet Elijah, were always taken care of. God sent Elijah to a river and commanded the ravens to bring him food. How incredible is that? And later, a widow cooking the last bite she and her son had in the house gave Elijah the food instead. She did what God required of her. And from that moment on, the grain and the oil in her home never ran out. Incredible, the goodness of God. So you might think we're going to talk about literal bread, physical bread. You might think we're going to talk about spiritual bread, And we are, because the connection's obvious. But there's another layer beneath both of those things that I think is well worth exploring. And it's what the line, give us today our daily bread, teaches us about God's desire to connect with us in a deeper way. Why would Jesus teach us to pray for bread if he wasn't interested in the small detail of our lives? And, and why would God want to meet our physical need if he didn't want to engage with us spiritually, which is so much more important? The layer beneath is about God's desire to be in relationship with us, in communion with us, in conversation with us. And that's what makes those six words give us today our daily bread so simple, but so profound. I'm summarizing my thoughts on this verse this morning in two sentences. One of them is a statement and the other a question. God is listening to us. Are we listening to God? God is listening to us. Are we listening to God? Jeremiah 29, 11, probably the most quoted and misquoted verse in all the Bible, for I know the plans I have for you. It's a great verse when it's used in context. But verses 12 and 13 are just as powerful. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. God is listening to us. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Are we seeking to hear God's voice with all our hearts? Are we listening to God? Let's think about that conversation for a moment. Firstly, God is listening to us. You might think that's an audacious claim to make, but let me explain why I make it with such certainty. What's the substance of the sentence? Bread, literal bread, a loaf. Jesus is teaching them and therefore teaching us to pray for our food. How do we know God's listening to us? Well, how many of us are hungry? In fact, I take my life in my hands and suggest I'm not the only one who needs to pray, give us today less daily bread. Enough toast in the morning and Subway sandwiches for lunch and baps around the burger for dinner. If bread is our, is our staple diet, I think we're taking the word staple to a whole new level these days. According to the Federation of Bakers in the UK alone, 12 million loaves are sold every day. On average, each person buys 43 loaves of bread a year. 75% of the bread we eat is white and 50% of it ends up in sandwiches. Last year, I couldn't believe this figure, 99.8% of households bought bread. Think about it. With plain bread, soda bread, potato bread, naan bread, bagels, baguettes. And we haven't even got to all of the new artisan options, cheese bread and banana bread. And it's far worse in America. There they have so much grain that if they were to fill a freight train with it, 
that train would stretch from one side of America and back again 13 times. That's how long the train would be. If we're praying for bread, I think it's safe to conclude God's listening. And there are other words in the sentence to reinforce that. Give us today our daily bread. We've no entitlement to the food on the plate. It's a gift. It wouldn't be there if God wasn't listening to us. In the very next chapter we read, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? James writes, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Every meal is evidence of God's faithfulness. Let's look at the next word, us. Give us today our daily bread the Jewish culture, you see, was completely different to the radical individualism that exists today. That's important because while this prayer might seem a little bit remote to those of us who have plenty, there are those in our community who can relate to it better. Remember, the disciples were roaming from place to place with no guarantee of a bed to sleep in or food to eat. Last year, 4,000 people in this city relied on the Craig Avon Food Bank. That's not about supply. There is enough to go around. That's about share. If you are hungry this morning, or you're watching online and you're struggling to feed your family, come and talk to us or call the number on the screen at the end of this service. And the other word to highlight is the word day. It exists twice in different forms. Give us today our daily bread. Remember the manna that was sent to the Israelites in the wilderness? It was fresh every morning. God doesn't promise to give us enough to store up and make us rich. He promises to meet our need, the need we have right now today. Before the end of the chapter, Jesus is telling them not to worry about tomorrow. Lots of us have been on short-term mission to Africa or to India where you are wakened every morning by the smell of freshly baked bread. Why? They don't have refrigeration and they don't cook with preservatives. The bread goes stale so quickly that they only bake enough for each day. I love that because yesterday's bread won't meet today's need. We're still talking about physical bread, but don't miss the spiritual significance of that. Are we as connected to God today as we were yesterday? Are we as connected to God today as we were last week, last month, last year? Yesterday's bread won't meet today's need. Lamentations 3.23, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions fail not. They are new when? Every morning. We're back to that same old hymn. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Have we food to eat? Have we clothes to wear? Have we a roof over our head? They're all gifts from God, gifts for today, and enough to share with others who are struggling right now. God, we've just sang it, God is faithful. All my life you have been faithful. How many of us can say that? Lots of us remember Corrie Ten Boom. You might have read her book or watched her movie. Corrie was 50 years old, an unmarried Dutch woman, um, who was leading an uneventful life until Hitler began exterminating the Jews. Her family resisted the Nazis by uh, helping their Jewish neighbors. Eventually, they were sent to Ravensbrück, one of the death camps. She writes about it in her book, The Hiding Place. 1,400 women 
lived in a barracks built for 400, and over time, 96,000 of them died there. When Corey and her sister Betsy arrived at that death camp, they were starving and Betsy was seriously ill. But Corey had managed to smuggle in a tiny little bottle of liquid multivitamins. Every morning, she placed one drop on their two slices of stale bread. Logic told her to hoard it, but she couldn't bear to see the other women around them fading. So she prayed for a miracle and began placing one drop on the bread of those sitting nearest to them. Five, 10, 15, 20, the list of women begging for one drop of the multivitamin just kept growing. Incredibly, it never ran out. She would hold the little bottle up to the light to see how much was left, but the glass was so dark she could never tell. But every time she withdrew the tiny dispenser, there was liquid on the end of it. Isn't it incredible that the God of the cosmos, who holds the planets in place, who calls the stars by name, is that interested in you and me? God is listening to us. Are we listening to God? Now, I don't want to over-spiritualize because the word in this verse is literally translated bread as in what you put in your belly. But I think it is worth looking at how the word is used in the Bible. It appears 492 times. Even Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, is called the house of bread. That's no coincidence. Listen to Jesus himself. Matthew 4, man shall not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Physical bread alone is not enough. God wants to meet our physical need too, but that requires us to really listen You'll often hear people say things like, the Lord spoke to me, or I heard the Spirit say, or I have a picture, or I have a dream, or I have a feeling that the Lord, whatever the form of words, it assumes the same thing, that God still speaks. Now, there are some who believe God only speaks through the Bible. They reference Hebrew 1 and 1 to 2. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. I don't think that means God only speaks through the Bible. I think it means that Jesus has the last word. If you think you hear God speaking by whatever means, but it doesn't line up with the teaching of Jesus then it isn't God's voice. There are two ways that God speaks to us, really, the Bible makes quite clear. General revelation and special revelation. General revelation is God speaking through nature. The sun, the moon, the stars. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, God seems to speak to me in every primrose and daisy and smile at me from every star and whisper to me in every breath of morning air and call aloud to me in every storm. Gauging by her awe-inspiring photographs on Facebook, I'll hazard a guess that Julie Timlin is descended from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Sometimes we're so busy looking for the mystical, we miss the blindingly obvious. The general revelation of God. And then special revelation is exactly what it says on the tin. Special, distinct, more experiential, more precise. The Bible is full of examples. God using angels and prophets and dreams and visions and fire. The list just goes on and on and on. In John 3, Nicodemus is given special revelation because the scales of religion fall from his eyes and he can see who Jesus is. In John 4, the woman at the well is given special revelation when she runs to her friends and says, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. She knows she has just encountered the Messiah. Special revelation. 
And don't forget Acts 1, when the Spirit is poured out on the disciples, they speak in different languages, and everyone receive special revelation because suddenly thousands are hearing the gospel in their own language. But this is my favorite example. Come with me for a moment to Acts 8, an event that happens after Jesus has died and, and, and rose again and ascended. So I think it counteracts the idea that the Bible is the only way to listen to God in this generation. It's the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. Verse 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Verse 29, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. That's very specific. Not just any road, not just any chariot. Clear direction and from whom? And the angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord. Philip was so sure he didn't hesitate. He was listening to God. Verse 30, then Philip ran. That's how sure he is. He ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Isn't that the perfect balance? Philip is sent by the spirit and he finds the man reading the scripture. Each listening to God. There's no contradiction between those two things. He's introduced to Jesus and the gospel is on its way to Africa for the very first time. Philip baptizes the man and if he isn't sure when he goes under the water, he's sure when he comes back up again because Philip isn't there. He has disappeared, supernaturally transported further along the coast, transported by the Spirit. You see, God is not limited. He speaks through the scripture and he speaks through the Spirit. Are we listening to God? In attempting to make the comparison between that physical bread in this text and the, 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 the spiritual bread that Jesus says we need to survive, I just have heard myself hearing the same three words. How much more? Earlier we looked at Matthew seven eleven. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? The same verse appears in Luke, but it's slightly different. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more does the God who fills our stomachs with good things want to fill our hearts and minds with his spirit so that we might connect with him more deeply, so that we might hear his voice? God is so good. The morning after Phil asked me to do this talk, my devotions were from Lamentations, a study on faithfulness. Later that day, I flicked on Spotify and a song I hadn't even downloaded began to play. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Later still, I walked into the lounge and Sarah was listening to a sermon from Passion Church and the pastor declared, God is so faithful. I thought to myself, God just makes it so obvious sometimes. If we really want to listen we know God is listening to us because of his interest in this small detail of our lives, the detail of our daily bread. But are we listening to him? How much more interested is he in the big business of life-changing encounters that happen when we open our ears to his voice? We're about to come into land, so let me think about the practicalities. This is a two-way process, so we need to think about how we communicate with God and how he communicates with us. So to do that, let me introduce you to two very special ladies. Clover Kerwin, my granddaughter. Now, come on, you didn't think I'd get through a whole sermon without mentioning her. And Ruth Blevins. No, not my wife, who just happens to have the same name, but my sister. Here she is, pictured on her 50th birthday a few years ago, dancing the night away with my mother in Spain. It's actually my mother's birthday today, so if you're watching, Mum, happy birthday. Um, I believe Clover and Ruth, each in their own way, have something to teach us about how God hears from us and how we can position ourselves to hear from him. Clover's been with us for much longer than we expected. 
waiting for her mom's green card for the United States to be processed during the pandemic. Goodness, it's been a long process indeed. She's eight months old now, and for quite a while, she's been finding her own voice. Sometimes she shouts to grab our attention. Boy, she's going to be some diva someday. Sometimes it's a soft humming sound, her own little wee song. And sometimes she babbles, it even does find a few words like mama or milk or whatever. But it doesn't really matter what the sound is. She immediately has her papa's attention. Why? Because I love her with all my heart. We don't have to pray in a certain way because the Father loves us so much we have his undivided attention. That's quite something, isn't it? Phil and Dave have given us great practical advice on prayer, but the thing that has always helped me most in this area is realizing that prayer is not just an activity, but an awareness. Prayer is not an activity, but an awareness. Less about doing, more about being, practicing his presence, becoming conscious that we have his undivided attention. Sometimes like Clover, we can't find the words, and that's okay. The Spirit himself intercedes through wordless groans, Romans 8, 26. Sometimes we don't even feel like praying, and that's okay too. Just begin to worship, and the breakthrough will come. That's what the Psalms are all about. And sometimes we could babble like a baby all day long, and that's okay too. Peter says, God's ears are attentive to us. God is listening to us. Are we listening to him? My sister Ruth has taught me so much about listening, and that is ironic to say the least, because she's deaf. Ruth has no hearing, no sight, and no verbal speech. The consequence of my mother having contracted rubella during her third pregnancy. Ruth communicates using a a very specific form of sign language called Paget Gorman. It's used by people who are both deaf and blind. Basically, you sign on to their hand rather than on your own hand. People often ask me, how did you learn sign language? And the answer is simple. The same way I learned to talk. Out of necessity. I couldn't have communicated with my sister otherwise. Think about that necessity. The extent to which we are developing our ability to communicate with God is an indication of how necessary we consider God in our lives. Four thoughts just to finish. Dependence. Ruth's incredibly independent. She's worked in Craig Evan Hospital for 33 years. But there are lots of things she can't do for herself. She does depend on mom. We're not positioned to hear God's voice until we have recognized our dependence on him. If you've never committed your life to Jesus, if you've never opened up that line of communication, that's where this relationship starts. And it can start right now, today. Dependence. Then silence. Ruth's world is completely silent. She's deaf and blind. She can't hear, but she has this really uncanny sense about conversations going on around her. We can be talking to each other uh, about something, and she will suddenly start to sign something related to that topic of conversation. It's a, just a weird thing. I wonder what we'd hear if we learned to be silent. Elijah didn't find God in the earthquake, wind, and fire. He found God in the silence, rest, and this, after the big I've had, this really is the pot calling the kettle black. So. How comfortable are we with our own company, with God's company? Two or three times a day, Ruth disappears to her room to rest because just existing with only two of the five senses is exhausting. Jesus regularly went off on his own or with his disciples to rest to be alone, to hear the voice of the Father. Dependence, silence, rest, and creativity. 
There isn't a sign for the deaf covering every word we speak. Sometimes we need to be creative to basically make up our own sign in order to communicate. Yes, the Bible is the primary source and the ultimate filter. But how creative are we about things like journaling or painting or even just fasting? Things that just might open that line of communication from God. Are we listening to God? You know, it struck me when I was preparing this that we prefer the sound of our own voices to the sound of God's voice. In the deeply polarized society that we live in, we're very quick to think, I must tell that person they're wrong. But they don't need to hear my voice. They need to hear God's voice. I'm not saying there aren't moments when we need to speak the truth in love. But as a friend of mine posted online recently, if we can't figure out how to be kind, then we should figure out how to be quiet. Instead of rushing to what other people around us will hear as judgment, let's just begin to pray that they hear the gentle, gracious voice of the Father calling them home. Unconditional love will speak louder than a million words. I remember reading the story of an old man who found prayer really difficult. Just pull up a chair, his pastor told him, and imagine God is sitting there. Years later, his daughter rang the pastor one day to say her father had died. I'm not sure why, she said, but in his final moments, he got out of bed, climbed into a chair, and he asked us to pull up another chair. The chair isn't empty when you're having a chat with the Father. God is listening to us. And the chair isn't empty when the Father has something to say. Are we listening to God? Maybe the next time we pray, give us today our daily bread. We'll pull up a chair and we'll listen carefully. Let's pray together. Father, we thank, we thank you that your ears are attuned to us. That you meet our every need. That you are, in every sense, a God who is faithful. And we pray that you would move by your spirit in our lives. To make us more sensitive to your prompting. To to make us more eager to search the scripture. But also to be creative enough to want to see you and hear you and sense you in new and different ways. Give us the courage to lean in a little closer. And not be afraid about what you might ask of us or where you might send us. Father, would you just this morning give us an increased sense of what it is to be in that close, intimate connection with Jesus. Where we know you're listening. And where we want to listen more. Until that day when we don't look through a glass dimly, but we see you face to face in all your glory, in radiant light, and we worship you, the lamb who was slain, seated upon the throne, the one who is holy, the one who is worthy, and in whose name we pray. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.